Listen to the vibes hosted by Coyote Night. Listen in for some positivity and good times. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Marshall, Will and Holly On the routine expedition Met the greatest earthquake ever known High on the rapids It struck their tiny raft And plunged them down a thousand feet below To the land of the lost everyone welcome to listen to the vibes i have here mr wesley your how are you today sir i am excellent thanks for having me on i appreciate it oh man i can't thank you enough because you were a big part of my childhood um saturday mornings land of the lost i mean that was television for me yeah run holly run there's a dinosaur <laughs> that's my entire performance for all those years on land of the lost <laughs> And, you know, here I am, an old man with, with my dolls. I've got Enoch here from Land of the Lost, and, and I've got Cassie from Dragon Tales, which is a show that I helped create. But, uh, yeah, Land of the Lost, it's been amazing. It just celebrated its 45th anniversary, 45 wow. years ago. You, I mean, who knew that when we were filming that show that 45 years ago, we'd still be talking about it. And it's still on the air. I mean, it just came back on the air on, on, on one of the channels, I think Tubi or something like that recently. It's been on... Uh, Netflix, it's been on PBS, it's, you know, it, it just keeps re, re bubbling up, <laughs> sort of, <laughs> like that's, the clan as well. <laughs> but, that's awesome, though. I mean, <laughs> the kids should be exposed to those things, because, I mean, Saturday mornings were was special when, when I was a kid, you know. I'd get up early, about six o'clock in the morning, I think the day started with Alvin and the Chipmunks, and then, you know, I can't I can't even name all of them I used to watch but I mean all the Sid and Marty Croft shows and stuff in Lidsville and you know there was Run Joe Run there was Shazam with Michael Gray yes. you know I mean, it was back in the day it was like it was like a big event Saturday was was kids day you know parents would sleep in you'd grab your bowl of cereal you would sit in front of the TV and you'd watch until you know 11:30 noon and then you know that was it but you know you you looked forward to it Oh, exactly. Oh, I remember when we used to get the TV guide in the mail and I would run and I'd go get it and I'd map out what I was going to watch for Saturday morning. <laughs> it's true. We had, you know, because we, uh, Kathy Coleman, who played Holly, mm -hmm. and Phil Paley, who played Chaka, the, the monkey boy. We do a lot of shows together, these autograph shows like Comic Cons and things like that. And it's amazing how many people we have come up to our table and talk to us. Um, how much it meant to them because, you know, Land of the Lost was a, a, it was written by the Star Trek writers. David Gerald was a head writer. He wrote Trouble with Tribbles, if you're a, if you're a Trekkie. Yes, Walter I remember. Koenig, Walter Koenig, who played Chekhov in the original Star Trek, created this character, Enoch. I did not know that. I see Walter, Kathy and I do the Star Trek convention at the Rio in Vegas every year. And... Walter, of course, is there signing autographs, and he has his little hat on, and he comes shuffling over, and he goes, those damn crofts, I should have got residuals on Enoch, I should have got residuals. <laughs> well, he, he did a Saturday morning show, too, didn't he? Walter? Yeah, I think he did. I, 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 I don't remember. I'm, I don't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. It was like... I don't remember if it was Jason, the Star Command, or something like that, but it was one of those uh, Saturday morning shows. But wow, that's that's another show in itself. It is. When people come up to our table, it, it, it it's startling sometimes. We had um, one guy; uh, he's in his fifties now because he used to watch Land of the Lost, and he said that he started was crying. And we said, "Are you okay?" He said, "Let me tell you something." He says, "I don't mean to be kind of like creepy here." He said, "But." After the second season of Land of the Lost and to the third season, we lost our dad and our uncle came in. He said, my mom and dad were getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. And he said, I didn't know how I was going to survive this. He said, I was devastated. I, I, 
I couldn't stop crying. I, I didn't know what to do. He said, but I saw in Land of the Lost, I watched you how you were able to transition without your father and move on and have a life. And he said, it helped me get through that time. And we we're like hugging him. And, you know, it, it's amazing. One, one girl from Compton, which was a really, really bad area, especially back in the 70s in Los Angeles. She said it was so dangerous in my neighborhood that we watched Land of the Lost in the morning. And my mom wouldn't let us go out and play. She was scared. So we would play Land of the Lost the entire weekend, hiding, making caves and running around with Slee Stack and, and stuff like that. And we have, we have so many stories. There was, a, there, were, there was one guy that came up to our table in Los Angeles at a show and he said, listen, I'm from Iraq and I thought you guys spoke Farsi because it was dubbed back in the day into Farsi. And he said, Land of the Lost, because of the sci-fi and all the writers, he said, I became interested in science. And he and his brother became two of the heads of Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And he said, we'd like to give you a private tour of JPL. So Kathy and I went and because of Land of the Lost, they let us into every nook and cranny of JPL. We even went into the room, this huge room. Imagine this room, is tons of computers, one guy sitting there with a joystick and a computer monitor, and he's programming the rover on Mars for the next day. And they let us come into this room. You have to go through security. And they let, they let us play with the joystick, you know, driving Mars. And this guy had, had a uh, driver's license for every rover he'd, he'd driven. The only guy that ever driven all the, the, the rovers that had ever been to Mars. And I mean, of course, when we played the joystick, it didn't move the rover because they program it, put it on the computer, test it out, and then they send it to Mars and it takes eight hours for the signal to get there and then the rover moves. So, but we got to play with the joystick and pretend we were moving it. But it's, it's amazing, uh, the effect of this little show. I mean, it was a Saturday morning show, you know, uh, a cheap little budget, and, but written by some of the greatest science fiction writers like DC Fontana and Larry Niven, all these people that back in the day, they were at the beginning of their careers, so you could afford them. And, you know, a few years later, they were the number one sci-fi writers, and you couldn't afford them. So. Well, you know, for, for people like me, I didn't have a whole lot of friends, you know, in my neighborhood. And, and um, you know, it, it, was, it got a little rougher as the older I got. But, I mean, Saturday mornings was an escape. And to have shows like yours and, like you mentioned, Shazam!, um, all these different shows, they, they impacted us in, in a certain way. And you don't want to sound like, you know, like that guy said, a creep or, you know, like this, oh, I'm a crazy fanboy or something, but these shows really meant a lot to us. You know, this was, this was another world. So, and I, unfortunately the kids nowadays, it seems like they have a, a 30 minute commercial for a cartoon or whatever. So well, also, also back then, you know, it was children's programming was regulated. And, you know, most of the, because when I created Dragon Tales, which ran from 2000 to 2009 on PBS, um, it, it was unlike the other shows at the time for kids too, because most every kid's show was, it was a smart aleck, young white kid putting down the parents, was smarter than the parents. And insult, it was all about insults and about, you know, hurting somebody and things like that. And Land of the Lost, you know, the reason it held up so long, it was, you know, we were a family, uh, our father and our sister, Holly, and, and we were trapped in a world with dinosaurs. We, we had lost our mother and there was a family group that held the show together. Mm -hmm. And it touched, it touched on a lot of issues that weren't touched on. And the scripts, you know, never talked down to kids. It's like the science fiction was, if you watch it, I mean, the, the, effect, the special effects look hokey now because it was state of the art at the time, but now, come on, we have CGI and stuff. But it we talked about uh, time doorways and matrices and, and doppelgangers and paradigms. And it, was, it, it, it explored a lot of issues, but it never had to explain it to the kids. The kids had to learn what it meant each week. And that's one of the reasons that, that kids were so, I think, fascinated by it. Well, I still remember the slee stack would make my anxiety go high. I was scared of those things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I get so the slee stack came out, I think, the second or third episode, and the ratings went off the charts. It, it was NBC's number one show. And the slee stack, I don't know if, it, if you know this, but uh, they were all basketball players at UCLA. They were the kids in college. They were seven feet tall, each of them. So they're seven feet tall, barefoot, 
They've got a stilt on with the pointed claws on the feet. They've got a pointed head like, like Enoch here, but went up. So they're about 10 feet tall in person. So all these guys were basketball players and one in particular, Bill Lambeer of the Detroit Pistons, who became the bad boy of basketball and is now the coach for the, I think the Aces, the, the women's team in Las Vegas, was a slee stack. No kidding. No kidding. And recently, Kathy and I were in Las Vegas for the Star Trek convention, and we went and surprised Bill. He was coaching the ladies' team. And when we walked in, the owner of the team had he didn't tell him we were coming, but all the, all the women knew. And they had a, an 8 by 10 of a slee stack. And as soon as we walked in, they pulled it out and held it above their faces. And, he, you know, he's like this, this Bill Lambert, Detroit Christian, and stuff like that. And, and the owner said to me, he says, I had never seen Bill smile that much. So I've got a picture and I look like, I look about this tall, <laughs> this tall. I mean, I'm not the tallest guy in the world anyway, but it was, it's, 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 it's almost cartoonish. But it, you know, it, it, it's amazing how, what went on for people in, in the careers after the show. So. So again, it, your, your dad on the show was Rick. Yeah, Rick Marshall. Okay, but the song goes Marshall, Will, and Holly. I know. Now I sang that song. I sang. <laughs> I sang the theme songs. The the uh, yeah, Marshall, Will, and Holly on a routine expedition met the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny raft. Ah! <laughs> Plunged them down a thousand feet below to the land of the lost, 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 to the land of the lost. And then Grumpy died and sort of, Rawr. But, and it was, yeah, it was Marshall, Will, and Holly, not Rick Marshall, Will, and Holly. Yeah, it was, it was, I remember the show was so low budget, I think that they wrote it so fast that they, they probably didn't even, it didn't even dawn on them. But in the third season, when we lost our dad, I had to go back in the studio with Michael Lloyd and re-record the theme song because it, it didn't make sense anymore for the third season. And it was, it went, uh, so the third season, it was uh, 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 Will and Holly Marshall, as the earth beneath them trembled, lost their father through the door of time. Uncle Jack was searching and found the kids at last, looking for a way to escape, escape, escape from the land of the law. Will and Holly Marshall, as the earth beneath him trembled, lost their father through the door of time. Uncle Jack went searching and found the kids at last, looking for a way to escape. But my favorite is the closing theme song. And so many rock and roll stars, like, uh, well, Tenacious D, Jack Black, have yep. done covers of this song. It's, when I look all around, I can't believe the things i found. Now I need to find my way. I'm lost, I'm lost. Find me living in the land of the lost, 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 <laughs> living in the land of the lost. <laughs> Sid Marty Croft. <laughs> When I look all around, I can't believe the things I found. Now I need to find my way. I'm lost, I'm lost. Find me living in the land of love. Living in the land of the love. I love it. I love it. <laughs> So, and you are an accomplished musician as well. Well, I, I used to sing. I used to open for Bill, for Bill Cosby at Harris in Lake Tahoe in Vegas. But, uh, I, and it was fun because, uh, you know, back in, in the day, I, 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 it's like, <laughs> I love to these shows. It's all about me, 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 me. I apologize. <laughs> but we, I sang in the third season and I had this like four string guitar, or like a gourd but it sounded like an orchestra, it was magic. <laughs> but I'd go to the Jacksons, the homes of the Jacksons. They wrote all the songs. I would go to their house 
they had an apartment house in Santa Monica next to the Mormon temple. And I would go to their Mormon temple and uh, across the street and we would record these little one minute ditties that we had. And uh, what was so bizarre though, I gotta tell you is they didn't have switch plates on their lights. I thought, I thought, these people are rich. What the heck's going on? I don't understand. They didn't, they were like just open switches and stuff like that. I'm going, why don't they finish this? This is an apartment building. <laughs> anyway, they were terrific guys. And <laughs> back, because back in the day, all the, all the guys and gals that were, you know, there were teen idols on 16 magazine and Tiger Beat and covers we did, like Michael Gray and uh, David Cassidy and all these different people, we hung out. You know, Sean Cassidy and Leif uh, Garrett used to come to my house and swim. Back, you know, back when we were young and pretty, but uh, you know, so it's just a different world back then. Uh, speaking of Leaf Garrett, we went to the antique mall in the city next to ours, and they had a Leaf Garrett album, and I almost bought it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> in fact, I got to show you this real quick. So give yeah, me yeah, a please. Minute. So I don't know about you, but I was like really big into happy days back in the in the day. Yep. I found this. Ah, oh, the Fonz, yay! Fonzie yeah. favorites, and I always <laughs> remember this because my original album did this too. You could, you know, make a make it like a picture frame and set it up. And I'm like, oh, I, I gotta know. have it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, amazing. Those guys, we, we filmed at General Services, uh, which was the old Charlie Chaplin studio in Los Angeles. And Happy Days was filming next to us. So we got to see these guys and, and back in the day, you know, running around and things like that. Then we moved to Goldwyn Studios uh, later on. But yeah, I mean, uh, and boy, Henry Winkler sure has made a career for himself. Unbelievable as, as an actor, as a director, producer. He's, you know, and I hear really nice things about him. I don't know him yet. I mean, I, I saw him on the set years ago when we were all starting out. But, you know, who knew what would happen with Ronnie Howard and all these amazing careers that took off. You know, I, was on, I was on Days of Our Lives at the same time. Not for just an hour, not for just a day. Not... Days of Our Lives for about a decade played Mike Horton. And Deidre Hall, who's one of the stars of Days of Our Lives, she was starring in Dyna Girl Electro. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the set of Land of Lost one day. I'm outside. She comes over to me. I've never met her before. She says, hi, Deidre. I'm doing the show here with the Crofts. And she says, I've got an audition for Days of Our Lives, and I know you're on the show. And I said, Deidre, I know what they're looking for. So she had her sides, which are the script that she had to learn for the, the audition, and we worked on it. And not that I helped her get the show or anything like that, because she's certainly talented, but she got the part, and to this day, she's the grand dam still of Days of Our Lives. And, uh, and, and she's a, just a delight, so. That's. Yeah, it's just all these. <laughs> Intertwining, yeah. No. Exactly, it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so, and you, you, you're an author, you direct, produce, all these things. I mean, tell us about all your projects. Oh my God. Kyle, this is, <laughs> this is, this is a Wesley Explosion day. <laughs> Hey, this is all about you, man. Sure. Oh, God. I have five books I've written. One book, Disney Option, for an animated feature. It's called The Red Wings of Christmas. It's, uh, and I wrote the screenplay of the songs for Disney. It's been sitting on the shelf, but they optioned it. And it's, it's available on Kindle, on, on Amazon, for the holidays. I have a lot of schools that use it, and uh, they read it. It's a chapter book. They read the chapter uh, after Thanksgiving until Christmas. And yeah, I mean, I, I, kids' books and Dragon Tales, and I've got a new show I just sold as an executive producer of a reality show, which I can't talk about yet because they won't let me. But uh, we'll be announcing hopefully within the next few weeks. We're going to production. It's been two years in the making of this show, and I do a lot of charity work. We raise a lot of money for um, shelter from the storm, battered women, uh, breast cancer, AIDS. Uh, I, I produce big shows with celebrity shows and we, you know, we raise a lot of money and it, you know, it's, it, that's, that's my giving back. I, I don't, listen, I am so blessed. I, I don't take any of this for granted. I, I'm a little kid from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I didn't have anybody in the, in the business. There was nobody, you know, they, I announced when I was five years old, I'm going to be an actor. And they go, <laughs> crazy kid. Yeah. 
<laughs> get out of our family. And, um, and so it, it was, you know, I, I, I am so lucky that to have had what I've had, you know, we all sometimes want more, uh, but I, a day doesn't go by that. I don't look around what my house and, you know, what I, my friends in my life and just go, wow, what a journey. And it's, it's, you know, gratitude. I live, I live in gratitude a lot. You know, I remember when the secret came out, the book about the secret and, uh, and it was this big hoopla about it. And the secret was, oh, my. <laughs> but the big secret, you know, it's gratitude being great. And I go, oh, duh. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. that's what, I mean, I literally, and I don't, not, not, I would, Pollyanna is my spiritual leader. That's my religion. Here's a girl that walked into a family that hated each other for decades. In two weeks, they all loved each other and were hugging and kissing. How much better could you be? You know, that, so that's, that's how I live my life. And I, you know, and I, and I try to give back as much as I can. Well, you know, I, I do a daily devotional. And one of the things I emphasize on is that gratitude changes your attitude. And people would just stop and, you know, every morning, I tell everybody, you, you get up and either you think it in your head, you say it out loud, or even better, write it down, all the things that you're thankful for, and, you know, look around at what you do have, and when you're grateful for what you already have, then you make room for new things to come into your life. I 100% agree, you know, I, 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 I years ago in the, uh, in the early 80s, I, I left Hollywood and I backpacked around the world and I moved to Bali. But, you know, we, I thumbed through Iran and Iraq and had knife fights in, um, in uh, Rangoon and the Irrawaddy River on, a, you know, the first uh, white people to, to be allowed back in in, in Burma in, in two decades and, you know, had slept in barnyards in India and, and all sorts of stuff and really lived the life. And because I kept going, there's got to be something better than this. I mean, I, I was having a lot of success and, but there was a lot going on in life that was pretty sad. And I thought, you know, what, what is this really all about? And I said, I'm going to go on a journey. Now I could think it was Bali high, <laughs> that whole musical. It was, I mean, it had nothing to do with Bali, but but I, I thought, okay, Bali, I'll go to Bali. And I began this journey through to Brussels and made my way through Greece and all the land and, you know, uh, through Iraq and, and Pakistan. And, oh, my God, the stories we had of <sighs> riding on the back of cement trucks and hitchhiking in Pakistan. You couldn't do that now. It's, it, it's too dangerous. The world is dangerous. But... Mm -hmm. It, it, it certainly opened my, my eyes. And when I, I, Disney bought my book while I was gone and there was no cell phones or things back then, it's the early eighties. And I told Disney I was leaving before and, and I said, I'm not coming back. If you want me to write something, I'll, I have to do it from Bali. Well, we, it, it wouldn't work. The phones, you had, to, you had to go to the post office, wait in line, get a, get a, a line out and talk is for a little bit of time. And they said, look, if you want your, if you want us to do your movie, you better come back. So I came back and and, and the Red Wings at Christmas, when I wrote the Red Wings at Christmas, um, I, I had a meeting at Disney. Um, and uh, Disney's brother came up to me and he said, Wesley, your book is the most spiritual book I've ever read. And I was like, thank you. I mean, it's, you know, the Red Wings at Christmas, it, it's the story of a uh, of a little boy in the 1850s, his name is Albert. And as a baby, he's washed overboard in a wooden cradle in a storm, a boat heading to America, a giant hand of a wave lifts up the cradle and washes him to the Thames River. And he's found by an old washerwoman named Tezariah. And he's raised by her until one night, everything is very Dickensian, everything dark happens. He loses Tezzy, there's, but there's a, there's Mr. Lacey's toy emporium that has been his joy to look in the window and Jack in the box. And one night he finds he's all alone. He's lost everything. He's a street kid called a mudlark. And they were kids back in the day and in England in the, in the 1800s that would scavenge the Tim River, Tim's River for coal or anything driftwood, that, anything they could sell. And they sang. 
And so this night, when he loses everything, he's destroyed, he's eight years old. He's under the, uh, one of the bridges and something falls on him, this cloth. And it ends up to be Father Christmas's toy sack that had fallen out of a, a sleigh. And he crawls inside and he begins to fall and tumble. And he enters this world where no child has ever been. It's a place where every broken toy goes. Because every toy that's ever been made, no toy has ever died. Every toy, because a broken toy can be loved and played with, but as soon as that toy is not to be loved or played with, its heart comes out and breaks in half because it's sad. And the two halves begin to circle the toy, light on the back of the toy and begin to unfurl and become these large red wings of Christmas. And they fly every broken toy into Father Christmas's toy sack. The wings are released, the heart comes back and they enter this infinite world where they're repaired, made ready, modernized, whatever it takes to find a new home. And it's Albert's, this little boy's journey in this world that he should not be and what happens. Oh, man. You and know, so, uh, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. I didn't oh, no, please, please go ahead. Uh, I was just say, in a world with so much negativity going on, it's nice to see people trying to bring some positive things and, in, in, you know, especially something where you see a, a kid that has lost everything and then going through this journey. Well, it, when I, when I, I, I wrote, the, oh, I'm going to cry. I, I wrote the book <laughs> and um, when I wrote the book, I, um, I, my, I gave this, the, my sister said, Here, here's a, something I'm working on. She read it, goes, Wesley, it's you. I go, no, no, it's uh, Albert, Wesley, it's you. And um, and I reread it, but when I wrote, I read, I wrote this book and, and I read it and I, I realized he, my dad left when I was two, he, he abandoned our family. And these were very educated people and he never came back. And I was set free in this world that I didn't belong in. It was all women. I had no men in my life. Um, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Texas for a while. Um, and I just, it was, it was me searching for it. And I realized, yeah, it, it was, it, it was about me. And I dedicated the book to my friend, John Allison, uh, who passed away, was a, a director from England. And he had died of AIDS in the, uh, one of the first to go in the early eighties. And I did, you know, and he had, he had given me the inspiration for, for, for the mudlarks in England and, and bringing it to that, that kind of sensibility. And, uh, and his journey, finding the red wings of his life and flying away to wherever he was going to go and, and he began anew, he was, was, was dedicated the book to. It was my best friend at the time. So um, it's, it's interesting. You write something and you don't really realize what you're writing. Because obviously we write our experiences in a, in a even if it's a, a totally animated sort of, uh, fanciful, fictional place. Turns out it's not so fictional. You know, it, it would have been very easy for somebody <laughs> like you. Oops, excuse me, I'm getting an echo there. Um, for, you know, you've had something tragic happen in your life and just to take that negative road, but yet you've brought so much joy into this world. I mean, like I said, my, my childhood, getting to watch Land of the Lost and and of course, my mother and her soap operas. <laughs> um, you know, it, Disney, the, the the Dragon Tales, and, and you know, plus you did the game show on Nickelodeon. And, and if you can find the hamburger hidden in this picture, then you can win a run through our prize-filled house, where what you find is what you keep on Finders Keepers. And welcome to Finders Keepers, the only show where trashing a room can win you some dough. But before we start playing the game, let's meet today is to keep bringing more and more joy back into the world. And you know, you should, there should be more people like you. No, I, I pre listen. Thanks. You know, I lecture. I, I lecture uh, at schools. Schools have me come in, and I, I teach kids how to write books and stuff like that. I have a within an hour, 
an entire auditorium of kids, we write a book and illustrate it in one hour. And, um, but I, it, Dragon Tales uh, has, w was an interesting journey because it went on the air and, and uh, you know, and now I, we do some shows and, and a lot of kids that are in their 20s, but we have a lot of kids that are on the spectrum. Ah. Oh that come to the table and they know every lyric and they see Cassie and the dolls, uh, I have the two headed dragon, Zach and Wheezy and, and Ord and the different characters that were there. And the excitement, I have one, one young man that I speak to, he's from, he lives in Texas and uh, Zach, and I can talk about him because his mom lets me, who, uh, who I call, he's in the hospital a lot and he's ill and, uh, and we sing the theme song to Dragon Tales all the time. And, and you know, it, it, it's, you just, again, you never know what you create, how it's gonna affect a ripple out into the world. And I've been lucky that uh, some of the things that I created, you know, have a positive spin that, that do bring joy. And that, you know, of course with Dragon Tales was PBS. And of course the edict from PD, PBS was to create a show that a positive a learning show and i remember I, I i got a phone call that the executive producer at sony pictures had his son's favorite book was the red wings of christmas the book i'd written he said wesley i've got these dragon droids you gotta come see these dragon droids and i think you could write something there's a six, uh, the u.s government is offering 16 million dollars for a new kid show and 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 sesame street wants it and the muppets want it and everybody wants it so i came and they had written some stuff i rewrote created created Sack and Wheezy and the Two-Headed Dragon and stuff, and put it together in three days, and it sold in a week, and we beat everybody out. Um, wow. But it was, it's amazing how, that, how all these things, Enoch, all these things ripple effect, and, and I, you know, I, I don't take it for granted. I mean, I, I don't. I, I'm just very blessed. I mean, here I am talking to you. I mean, this, what, what, a, what a joy. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, you know, I, I wanted to have a show where people could come on and tell their story and be an inspiration for other people, you know, give them some extra motivation and positivity. And you, you exude that. I will say you. you really do. That's me sucking up. <coughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. I was wondering when you were going to get to sucking up. I thank you Cal, for goddamn time. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I, I I I ran across your your picture the other day, and I said I've I've got to I got to look him up because I mean, I guess I can't say enough how much you've been an influence on me, and um, and so I, I found your Instagram, and I said okay, I got to make sure this is the the right guy, and then went to your website, and I, and so I said I'm gonna take a chance. And, um, and I wrote you an email and when you responded, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was elated. I'm like, Oh, I can't believe it. He actually answered me, but you know, we need more positivity in this world. That's that I guess that's my point is we really do. There's, you know, everything you turn on the TV or on social media and YouTube, it's always something negative, you know, whether it's politics or, you know, whatever, craziness is going on but you don't get a whole lot of people just coming out and say hey let's let's try something positive for a change you know you can find a few but it seems like everybody just wants to talk about what's bad going on in the world i i have a rule with my friends first of all on facebook i never post anything negative i, th I thought there is enough of that if i can't i post nothing if there's nothing positive or fun or something you know to talk about but my rule with my friends, because I'm getting old. I mean, I'm up there now. You know, I'm, I'm getting way up there. And um, my rule with my friends, because as you get older, everybody wants to talk about their ailments and their problems and this and that. And I said, look, here's the rule. We get together, you got 10 minutes. Go for it. Hospitals, medicines, you know, politics, the world. And then when that's over, the 10 minutes is over, then let's talk about Let's talk about art and life and, and travel and things like that. Let's, let's do this because you know what? Otherwise it will suck the energy out of you. And it's like, 
you know, I, I now spend half of the year in Mexico, I, um, in Puerto Vallarta. I, I have a house in Mexico now, and I go there for, ha can't go this year because of the COVID, and because it's, it's really bad there. The virus is really devastating in Mexico. And, but we go there and just the world stops. You know, it's going to the beach and having coffee all day. It's just, you know, it's just, it's doing nothing except happily doing nothing. <laughs> and, and having friends and laughing and giggling and singing and stuff like that. And, you know, and, and believe me, I am aware of the tragedies and I am acutely aware of the suffering of a lot of people. I don't take it for, I mean, again, I, I, I get it. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I'm not the ostrich with my head in the sand. I do what I can. And, and whether it's fundraising or whatever it is, but then you gotta live a life too. Because if, if there's no beacons out there of hope and happiness, then what, uh, I, I lost my stepdaughter uh, to cancer, she was 21. And she said to me before she died, she said, she was out doing stuff and you know, she, there she was cancer and she was out there going to college and getting a double major and all that stuff and working with, she got out of the hospital and said, I got to work. I went to Bank of America, got a job and going to Texas A&M and all this stuff. And um, she said, I go, you, you don't need to do this. And you know, she said, what's the point of struggling to live life if there's no life to live afterwards? True. So. That's touching. Really is, uh, you know, people will sit here and want to go over, oh, this is going wrong in my life. I don't have this, I don't have that. But they don't stop and think about the other people in the world that have it even worse. And when you see somebody who, who knows they're not gonna be here very much longer, but they still wanna live their life, that should be an inspiration for those of us who do have a life to get out there and live it. Yeah, I, 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 when I backpacked around the world, uh, and really backpacked around when we weren't staying at the Hiltons <laughs> with dollar a night hotels if we could get them in Pakistan. Um, you see the other, you see what we have here. The worst case scenario here sometimes is the best case scenario in another country. And it doesn't minimize because everything, you know, everything's relative. I, each of our experiences are relative. You know, whatever you have is your experience and whatever, you know, somebody has more or less or whatever. It's, you know, it's relevant to you and it's relative. So, but when you see such an extreme, like in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and things like that, um, I could not have been more grateful for my life. You know, I remember coming home, flying suddenly back to do this thing for Disney and I had been, you know, we'd been living off of $5 a day was our budget. And that was travel, food, and lodging. $5 with two of us. And I, I, my mother and my sister picked me up at the airport. I flown in, you know, I've been living in Bali. I fly in and they take me to Dupar's restaurant in Los Angeles at the old farmer's market, which is gone, I guess. And I look at the menu and I think like the, 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 the burger or something was like twelve ninety five, and I like I I froze. I just like, I I because my 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 mindset had been five dollars for my life every day, and twelve ninety I I I froze. And my mother said, Wesley, you're back in the states. Deal with it, you know. And I go, yeah, but it's twelve ninety five, and so everything you know is relative. And, and we've got to find common ground on this planet. We have to politically and everything we've got to. And uh, because at the end of the day, we are genetically and DNA, all brothers and sisters, all from the same sources, you know, the color of your skin or hair or whatever that is, it's just a very thin superficial thing that happened because of the climate where you lived and whatever. But we're all, all of us brothers and sisters. And, and to, to separate ourselves from that is a very, it's a very lonely thing to do, and it's also a very dangerous thing to do, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, years ago, I had went to Monterey, Mexico, and we were on a uh, retreat, basically, for the church. We went to, uh, we went to a church there where we had, we'd been supporting for years, and um, after we have our revival, we would go out and, you know, just hang out in the streets or whatever, and 
you know, I kept thinking, yeah, uh, yeah, I've got it so bad at home. But then I see these people with hardly nothing and I'm sitting there and I'm rubbing my eyes and I'm telling my wife, I said, my, my eyes are just burning. I don't know what's wrong. And all of a sudden this kid just darts past me and we're walking around and we're still talking and this kid comes up and he brings me a bottle of Visine and runs off. And this kid had nothing, but yet the little bit he did have, he thought so much of us because we had come there as part of the church that, that he wanted to give back to us. Like, oh my God, I don't, I don't have it as bad as I think I do. And here this kid has nothing and he gave, he gave me what little bit he had just for me to be comfortable. Yeah. You, you know, when, when I say that I live in, in Puerto Vallarta, the visions are, oh, Puerto Vallarta. I live in the hood in Puerto Vallarta, I have a house in, with the drug dealers and I live in the, with the local people. I don't live, I live close to the tourist area. But my house is where, you know, the cartel, they're selling stuff down, down below. I looked at a three-story house and looked down, you know, it's, it's a real neighborhood. And, you know, and it, 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 we, 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 I, cause I learned the language and, and, you know, we shop and I mean, I have my, my hoity-toity friends, trust me. And I've got all the, all the bells and whistles when I walk, you know, seven blocks towards the beach, but we live, you know, in a, in a real world with chickens on the streets and dogs and horses walking up and down and things like that. And I even remember in Pakistan, when we were backpacking, the place we were gonna stay had closed the youth hostel and we were scared. We didn't know what to do. It was Pakistan, we're at the border of Afghanistan. It was during the Russian war, Afghanistan. So we were right there at the border of Peshawar. And this professor, we were standing there, he says, he spoke English, he goes, which I said, well, there was supposed to be a youth hostel here. And he goes, no, it's gone, it's been gone. And he goes, I said, well, I don't know what to do. We have no place to go. And he says, well, come with me. And he put us in the back of a pickup truck. And we're in the back, we don't know where we're going, strangers. We have 100 pound backpacks on our back with teddy bears sticking out. And, and we're getting to a certain point, he goes, throw the blanket over, cover yourself, cover yourself. And we're like, oh, okay, we're covering ourselves. And he drove us into Afghanistan into a compound, walled compound, and we get out and he says, you'll be safe here tonight. And they went, they said, what, what do you want to eat? And I was scared. I mean, I'd just gotten into a really third world country, Pakistan, we're heading to India. And I was scared to drink anything or eat anything. And I said, cookies and oranges. Well, I, I didn't realize how expensive they were. And that family that we were with the kids and the family and, the, and all their, their relatives, and they went out and bought cookies and, and, and oranges. And we, it wasn't until we'd left, and months later, we, I understood what had happened, the value of what they had given us. And they didn't have a lot, believe me. You know, we slept in, in their bedroom, they gave us their bedroom. So the world is a very generous, wonderful place. And just because you have nothing doesn't mean you, you have nothing to give. True. Well, one thing I could say is when it comes to social media and, and all that stuff, all you hear about is all the terrible things in the world. But when you get down to really talking to people in general, most people are, they're, they're good at heart. All of us want to be happy. I mean, all of us want to be stress-free. I mean, unless you're nuts. And you got, you know, I know a lot of nutty people, but you know, all of us, we want to, listen, I, got, I am so blessed. I look around this, this, this place I live in Palm Springs, California, and I go, well, days of our lives paid for this and, and you know, and land of the loss paid for that. And, you know, how lucky, I mean, and I'm still alive. I mean, you know, I'm and still, still kicking and, 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 you know, and still dreaming. Cause that's the thing is not to lose the dream. Don't just sit around and, you, you know, I, we were sitting around, uh, you know, a few years ago, and I go, I can't, do, I can't just sit here in the United States. I, I got to create something new. So, went to Mexico and then create a whole new life in Mexico. And so I'm back and forth. And I, so dreaming, just keep the dream alive. Find something, something to help somebody. To, you know, if, if you're depressed, go help somebody. Just, I mean, I know it's, it's, it's cliches, but cliches are reason are, are there because there's there's truth in a cliche.
But one of the things in the book, The Secret, it talks about is stop focusing on your own problems and start, you know, helping other people. And it takes your mind away from that part of your life. You know, you're not thinking of the negative stuff. You're thinking of other people. And before you know it, it's turned to positivity. I know. I remember seeing, and I know you've seen it, and, and, and those experiments with water, you know, filming water, how molecularly water changes when you say wonderful things, you say, I love you or you're beautiful water. Mm -hmm. And it all, the patterns become uniform in the water. You start screaming and yelling at it, they become disjointed. So there is, there's so much we don't know. There's just, we are so, you know, we are such a small little species that has just kind of crawled out from the ooze on the, on the, the timetable. I mean, you, you know, you think of dinosaurs being, you know, 20, 200 million years ago, or whatever, whatever it is, you know, gosh, you know, I know dinosaurs because I've actually ridden dinosaurs. I've played with dinosaurs. I've run from dinosaurs. So I'm an expert. And, uh, but, you know, we are just this little, we, we just don't really know hardly anything that's going on. You know, I looked at the, there was a great moon, the blue moon last night and looked at that beautiful moon. Wasn't that extraordinary? I thought how little we really are. Just, just, be, just to be reminded, doesn't mean you have to go there in a dark place, just go, okay, this is the reality. Now, move on. Exactly. You know, I've always been, religion, I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to backpack around the world is I wanted to study religions, and I did. I lived with the Sikhs, the Hindus, the Muslims, the, the Christians, the Jews, the Jains in, in India, I, I, and I lived with them, and I wanted to study the Rashrams and stuff, and I wanted, because I wanted to find what was true for me. You know, was Christianity was, you know, I was, you know, raised Southern Baptist, went to, you know, Presbyterian. And then I, what was, what, what was true anymore in my life? And, but I, I always think about the, and I was never Catholic, but Catholic holy water, where they bless the water. And now we know, we know we can film it, that by blessing the water, it actually changes the water mone uh, uh, molecularly. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's, you know, it's really, it's interesting. And, and I, re I remember I'm in India and I've really been searching and, and I, you know, I thought, I thought, well, Buddhist was kind of more what I'm into about, about uh, don't pray to one God, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's the universe and I, whatever. I thought, well, that, you know, um, and so we're in India and there was supposed to be, there's like seven holy places of Buddha. And where he, the different poses, but the one where he puts his hand down, you see the, pho the, the photos, the photos, the carvings. Uh, of course, when, when Buddha was alive, you know, Buddha said, make no image of me. And he refused to have, there was no paintings of Buddha. We don't know what he looked like. It was only two years later when the Christians were having, were selling their crosses and everything. They said, oh, well, we better make some money. We better create something. So they did. They, Buddha's face is like a lotus flower and stuff like that. Anyway, so we had heard in India, we were, at, I forget which town we were in, and there was one of the holy places. And so we paid this rickshaw guy who pulled us on a rickshaw talking about gratitude. And it was $2 round trip. It was 20 miles away. He pulled us 20 miles one way and 20 miles back the other way. For oh my gosh. So, so we're going through this thing and I felt I was, I mean, we obviously gave him more money and, uh, but I felt like an ass. I mean, I felt, I, I was so, I was so upset with myself. I felt, I felt so elitist and uh, anyway, so we're passing this little town, it's a dusty town and there's like a little museum. I see a little sign says museum in, 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 uh, in Hindu and then English. I go, oh, let's go over there. So we go in and, and we walk in, it's like, imagine the 1930s uh, display cabinets with, with old, like an old library with dusty shelves and everything's typewritten, you know, what this little thing is and what this little thing is, just a little thing. And I remember it changed my life. It was, there was on a tight little handwritten type thing from who knows when. And they were just said, all religions teach the same, the golden rule, do unto others. It's the basis of every religion. And I went, ah, of course. Yep. And, and so the, my, you know, Pollyanna, do unto others. I mean, that is, that is, that is my mantra. And I, you know, every time I, I do an action, I think, how would I, how would this affect me if I was doing this to somebody? Because I have done things in my life, I will sit, that I have regretted. And I will sit in a, a, on a lonely dark night and I'll go, why, why, why did I do that? 
I wish I could go back and I, I try to pray it away or I try to, you know, spiritually do whatever to, to make amends for what I've done. And, um, but it haunts me and they become, the, the more I, the more I, 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 I get into that space about not doing harm, the more the harm that I've done. And I, I mean, I'm not talking that I didn't like really beat anybody up or anything like that, but whatever things that we've all done in our past, it, they become more magnified, it seems. And I, and I regret them terribly. And I said, okay, I, you know, live your life in, in gratitude and, and, and service. And I mean, that, that's just, I mean, that's just what I try to do. And I try to do in all my work and, and I try to speak that voice. Well, everything that we do during life, it's, it's, it's a step to, uh, to, to more understanding. When we make mistakes and things like that, if you recognize that it was a mistake and you move on, you, you've learned from that and you don't want to do that again. The, the key is, is to, to, you know, waking up to these things and realizing what you did wrong and that it was wrong. And, you know, like you said, the golden rule, if, if you can do that, if you can treat others like you'd want to be treated, then you can't go wrong. Yeah. I always like to think that reincarnation is real. I, you know, I know that in Bible, it used to have reincarnation. There were, you know, Gregory in the fifth century took a lot of stuff out and rearranged everything. A lot of controversy about that. But I would say, okay, let's just assume, because I, listen, I make no, no pretenses. I know nothing. I, I, you know, I'm just on this planet. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. All I can do is live a great life and be kind as I can be and stuff like that. But I said, if there is reincarnation, then why don't you just work through it in this life? make amends, live a good life, you know? And so if there's not, fine. If there is, then, then hopefully you'll reap the benefit of, of that kind of behavior, you know, for me, so. Yeah, well, you, you remember, you, you think good thoughts, you speak good words, and you do good actions. Right, and I love what you guys are doing with the vibe and, and, and the radios. So, and stuff like that. I mean, I think it's really a, a really powerful thing, especially in, in, in these times. And it's something that we all need. And, and you know, I, I find myself, I can't watch the news now. I can't, I, I try to t turn to, to I, I can't even, I can't, I can't watch any show, any movie anymore that somebody's wrongly accused. It, it viscerally makes me, I, I get upset. I, I've become, I, there's so much been going on. So I, I try to watch, okay, I'll go to, I'll go to animated shows. I watched an animated show, a Japanese one about, about the moon and stuff. And suddenly there was some, the mother dies in the first two minutes. I go, no, stop. This is a Bambi, please, please. This is supposed to be animation. I want happy. <laughs> and fortunately, that, those kind of things don't seem to sell with the, you know, the, the, as a fad, you know, you got to go, they want everything negative, death and, you know, destruction and that that's what sells and there's enough of that we we need more positivity in this world yeah I, g g give me give me uh hgtv let let me see the property brothers or somebody let's let's see them take an ugly house and make it pretty at the end let's you know it's pygmalion for houses and i just <laughs> i just want to you know i want a happy ending i just want a happy ending You've been talking to my wife, haven't you? Because she makes me watch that every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I'll binge watch it. I mean, welcome to COVID. I mean, I, I'll sit here just, you know, but you know, I love my judge duties. I love my judge shows because, you know, hopefully there's, there's, there's that, that wrong gets righted at the end. Now, lately, I got to tell you, I'm not so, so, so thrilled with the judges. I think they're making some terrible decisions but, because I'm, I'm opinionated, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I want, I, 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 I want, I, I want joy. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I literally viscerally cannot, cannot stay in this dark place that, that the world is bombarding us with all the time. All the messages, all the messages, even consumerism, all that stuff, you know, which I'm part of and all. I mean, I, you know, I like it. I enjoy all the perks of everything. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I, it just doesn't work for me emotionally anymore. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I'm very fortunate that I have in a position where I can, I can choose a life. There's a lot of people that don't have that choice and are in the situations where they, they have to, to
to do certain things. They have to, to work every day. They have to struggle. They've got kids that are ill. They've got family that's, that are ill. They've got, they've got responsibilities that don't allow them to be like so foo-foo and happy and all that kind of stuff. And I get it, believe me, because I've had my share of it too. And so I, I, I'm not trying to say that, you know, it's, I, I, I get that everybody has their own life and, and their own obstacles and battles. I'm just saying that there's hopefully, hopefully, in the darkest of all of our moments, we can look to some other source for light. Yeah, though there's always hope out there. You know, the the person that complains ain't got no shoes is not looking at the person that don't have no feet. You know what I mean? And and I must say this too: we are a species that are that is meant for intimacy, not isolation. So to it, it, i hate the fact that people want to draw this line in the sand and say if you don't believe like i do you cannot cross that that line or we're going to get into it you know I, I, i'm i'm and i just try to stay away from politics and stuff like that in my shows uh because there's, there's already enough of that going on people hear enough of that all the time you know i have my opinions but you know unless you just want to sit down and discuss them i'd rather not put it in you know out there because I'm, I'm trying to appeal to everyone bringing positivity in. And so let's, let's set aside our differences. Let's sit down and let's have talks like we used to. Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, we're all brothers and sisters. We are mm -hmm. all, I mean, it's, it's not even ethereal. It is physiologically. We are all DNA and all that. Mm -hmm. We are part of everyone. And to deny that, to create that separation. I mean, we've always been a warring species. I mean, one of the reasons we've been so survival is, you know, we, we fought and kill and territorial and land and, you know, we're, you know, we climbed out of the trees or whatever happened, you know, and, and have become a warring species. And, and hopefully, hopefully that gets less and less and less and less, you know, as our time on the planet extends. We can just hope so, you know, think positive, Yes. <laughs> think positive. You got it because it, positivity attracts more positivity. So if you're thinking negative, you're going to attract more negative. Just that's just the way it is. I agree, Cal. I really agree. But man, this has been awesome. I appreciate you being here, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me spout off, you know. Hey, no, this is your time. You get to talk about what you want to talk about. Yeah. And you're doing Wizard World? Yeah, I'm doing on uh, uh, the 11th and or the, or the seventh and, and then this next Saturday, uh, uh, Wizard World. Where's it? Go to wizardworld.com. There's there's going to be an actual free panel that Kathy Coleman played Holly will be on, and Phil Paley played Chaka. Now Chaka, Phil Paley, of course he was Phil Paley when he got the part of Chaka. He was I think eight years old. He was the youngest black belt in karate in the United States. Really? So there is his teacher was Chuck Norris, and there's a clip. And if you on the Johnny Carson show with Johnny Carson. You can Google it. It is hysterical. If you just Google Johnny Carson, Phil Paley, and Chuck Norris, it'll come up. Where Phil is about, you know, is about two and a half feet tall in his little white, little white karate outfit with the black belt, and Johnny's this towering above him, and Phil flips Johnny over, and it's hysterical. And so Phil was on the the, the Tonight Show, and they were Land of the Lost was starting, and they needed a guy to play the monkey. And they were, you know, the, the Crofts used a lot of little people. And, but they saw Phil on the show and thought this guy could do the physical character, the monkey stuff. And so they hired Phil. And, you know, of course it turned out amazing because he was a great actor because he had to speak Pakuni, that language they created for him, which was a real language at, at UCLA. And it, 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 was, it was amazing. So all these things, it maybe has how his appearance on the Tonight Show led to Chaka, you know, leading to a, a whole different world that opened up for him. <laughs> yeah, I say y'all brought us so much joy and you still are. And I can't thank you enough for that. And you have made my day for sure. Thanks, Kyle. So mine too. Thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciate you and I appreciate everybody that watches and supports the channel and uh, continue to do so. And we will catch you on the next one. You got it. Take care. When I look all around, I 
We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favourite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network and on Instagram at The Vibes Broadcast. 